morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for staying here through the third day. It means either you're still open to new learning or you've got nothing better to do until your flight goes. Uh, so either way, you're here. Uh, it's an honor to be asked to do this. Uh, somebody from the Little Apple, Manhattan, Kansas, Riley County Police Department. Um, it, is, it is truly an honor to be here among a, a lot of people that are uh, far brighter uh, than I am and doing things uh, far better than we are, and we're here to learn just like you are. Uh, today I wanted to talk about uh, changing the message in policing, or one of the messages in policing. I was recently at a ceremony where police executives from around the country were being recognized for their professional development. And one of the speakers commemorating the event said something very profound about a significant problem in policing except he didn't intend to say it that way or to have it mean that. He said, we in law enforcement are the only thing standing in the way between the innocent and those wishing to do them harm. I'm going to repeat that. We in law enforcement are the only thing standing in the way between the innocent and those wishing to do them harm. Emphasis added. Um, Let's think about that for a moment and apply the math to it. The national average of police officers per 1,000 residents in U.S. cities is 1.7. That's higher here on the East Coast, but in most agencies, it's 1.7 or less. But let's forget that uh, that definition includes everyone from the chief on down to the newest officer in the academy. And let's forget that of that 1.7, roughly 60% are assigned the duties we normally associate with that of a police officer, the road cop or the beat cop. And let's forget that 60% of that 60% are normally available for those duties. The other 40% being on some type of leave or in training or testifying in court or a dozen other administrative activities, leaving the actual number closer to six tenths of an officer per thousand. But we're gonna set that aside and for a moment, we're going to pretend that the entire 1.7 per thousand are available to stand in the way between the innocent and those wishing to do them harm. In my city, Manhattan, Kansas, there's about 55,000 residents, which means we should have around 93 police officers. And we've got a few more than that, but it's pretty close. So let's divide those 93 police officers by three time shifts, spread them across a seven-day week, and give them regular days off. The net result is that at any given moment, there are fewer than 20 police officers standing in the way between those wanting to do harm and those 55,000 people. If you're one of those 55,000 people, and in your own city you are, how do you like those odds? I think even the Spartans had it better than you do. Let me put this problem another way. Many of you have children. Suppose you're at a back-to-school night, and you're standing in the auditorium or the gym, you're listening to the principal. And at one point she says, the only thing standing in the way between ignorance and your children are their teachers. Let me repeat that. The only thing standing in the way between ignorance and your children are their teachers. As a parent, what would you think about that? Would you accept the premise that you don't have a role in your child's education? Of course you wouldn't. Our education system is built on the idea that parents and the school and the community work together to create both the physical and the social environment necessary to foster learning. Why then wouldn't we want a law enforcement system built on the premise that the community and the police work together to create the physical and social environment necessary for safety and security. If someone breaks into your own house, do you defend it because you're a police officer or do you defend it because it contains the people that you love? If someone breaks into your neighbor's house, do you come to his defense because you're a police officer or because he's your neighbor and your friend? And don't you want your neighbor to come to the defense of you and your family whether he's a police officer or not? Why is it then that so many in policing believe 
that we are the warriors, the only thing standing in the way between the innocent and those wishing to do them harm. Now, I don't fault the speaker entirely. I know him. He's actually an intelligent, dedicated professional. The problem is the message that our profession is sending him, that we really are warriors doing battle every day against the forces of evil, or even worse, that we're the sheepdogs, protecting the mindless, helpless sheep from the wolves. The truth is we are not warriors. We are not at war. Aaron said that very thing yesterday. We're peace officers. We're guardians. We're watchmen. Our visible presence serves as a reminder to the community that we're on watch at all times so that they can spend most of their time engaged in other roles. Our role just happens to be that of full-time instruments of safety and security. But if, you're the, if we're the only ones serving that role, our communities are going to be less safe than they should have to be. Now, I will grant you, as we've talked about the last couple of days, there is a time when the warrior cop, the combat cop, is the best and only solution to a problem. We just saw that in Orlando. And we have to train to be ready to answer that call when that role is necessary. But we can't let that role dominate our profession to the point where we truly believe that we are the only thing standing in the way between the innocent and those wishing to do them harm. Why is this distinction important? Why are we talking about this? Because the community that we serve, they do not want the dominant mindset to be that of a warrior for us as public servants. And that's who we are. We are public servants. We answer to the public. So at a time when they're calling for accountability and transparency and a greater voice in how their communities are being policed, we're calling for tactical gear and armored vehicles. Okay. At a time when they're asking for relationships and partnerships, we're asking for increased electronic surveillance and counterintelligence. And by the way, partnerships and relationships with the community, the best counterintelligence you're going to have. They want to believe in trust. We believe there are two kinds of people, those who have committed crimes and those who will commit crimes. They want police officers. We want to be combat cops. If we continue down the path where the warrior mindset dominates our profession, at best, we're going to have change forced upon us, change that we don't have a voice in. It's already happening now, maybe at some of your own agencies. At worst, we're going to face a community that sees us as an illegitimate authority, an occupying army, a community whose compliance depends solely upon our ability to impose punishment. So how do we change that message? How do we redirect the conversation away from the dominance of the warrior and more towards the peace officer, the guardian, the watchman? I believe there are three things that we can do, three things we must do in order to start changing that message. The first thing is hire the right people. Now we know that inside almost every police officer applicant, there's someone who wants to drive fast and arrest bad guys. And some of them will admit it to you if you ask them. And guess what? They're going to have to be able to do that. There's no doubt about that. The other 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to be working with other people to solve problems. Citizens, fellow officers, urban planning, public works, advocacy groups, racial and ethnic minorities. Most of the time, these people are going to be cooperative and willing to solve problems. Sometimes they won't be. Regardless, your officers are going to have to work with all of them every day. Find a way to test a, can a candidate's capacity to work with others, to solve problems, and collaborate with people like them and with people who are very different. Someone who can learn to do that well can be taught to drive fast and arrest bad guys. So hire the right people. 
That's the first step. The second thing we must do is train the right way. And here I will be really specific. There's only one nationally recognized training model that was designed specifically to teach problem solving and collaboration. PTO model, Police Training Officer Program. It's the only national model that was first built on research into what police agencies across the country actually expect from their officers on a daily basis. It's the only national model that uses adult learning strategies to teach trainers and trainees. It's the only national model to promote the value of emotional intelligence in policing. It's the only national model that separates coaching, training, and mentoring, the most important aspects of recruit development, from evaluation. And it's the only national model that uses real-world problems as the hub for learning, the kind of problems officers will face every day. If you're an agency that says you're involved with community policing or community engagement or problem solving and you're not a PTO agency, I'd like to hear the rationalization from your chief of police or your commissioner. And if you're one of those agencies that's not PTO but you're looking to become one and you're scouting the landscape for uh, agencies that are PTO agencies, if one tells you Come visit us, we know exactly what we're doing. We have PTO exactly right. Run away from them as fast as you can. The agency you wanna visit is the one that says, you know, we do some of these things right. We're still struggling with some elements. You're welcome to come, take a look at what we're doing. Maybe you can offer some advice. Those are the people that you wanna to talk to. So back to changing the message. First, we have to hire the right people. Second, we have to train them the right way. And third, we have to promote the right behaviors, both internally and externally, in and out. We talked about that yesterday when we talked about culture. And this is what I mean. Suppose you're an agency whose evaluations place a great deal of weight on problem solving and collaborating with the community, and they should. Suppose you're an agency whose reward system is built to recognize officers who engage the public in problem solving and collaboration, and it should. Suppose you're an agency who publicly recognizes officers for problem solving and collaboration, both in formal ceremonies and through social media, and you should. Finally, suppose you're an agency where communication comes from the top down. Nothing goes back up. All decisions, and all solutions come from the chief and the command staff. An agency where avoidance is the most common form of conflict resolution used. Tell me how strongly those officers at that agency truly believe their leaders understand and value problem solving and collaboration. And tell me how long it will be before problem solving and collaboration are done at a level only sufficient enough to avoid punishment. If we expect and we demand from our officers problem solving and collaboration outside the walls of our agencies, we have to demand and expect the same thing inside the walls of our agencies. Employee engagement, problem solving, collaboration, shared leadership. Yes, that kind of culture, and you have to build a culture that supports that, that kind of culture will reduce our executive power as decision makers. I understand that. But think about what it will increase. Trust in the chief executive. Trust in the organization's leaders. Trust in the organization itself. The very results we want from our officers problem solving and collaborating with the community. And it just so happens that building trust and legitimacy and that's the other thing that you get. If you have the trust of your officers, if you have the trust of com your community, you have legitimacy. People will willingly follow legitimate leaders. A community will support and accept the authority of a legitimate police agency. And it just so happens that building trust and legitimacy is the first and the most important pillar of the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. And I want to close with a quote from that report that echoes what we've been talking about the last couple of days. 
law enforcement culture should embrace a guardian rather than a warrior mindset to build trust and legitimacy. So back to that message at the beginning. We in law enforcement are the only thing standing in the way between the innocent and those wishing to do them harm. How do we start changing that message? First, we hire the right people. Second, we train them the right way. And third, we promote the right behaviors. Hire, train, and promote. Then we can look forward to a new message and attending a ceremony where law enforcement executives from around the country are being recognized for their personal development and professional development and hearing one of the speakers say, we in policing are proud to serve communities where all of us play a role in protecting each other from those wishing to do us harm. Thank you.